Let's pray. God, what marvelous uh, truths that we get to sing together, even encourage one another by hearing voices all around us uh, singing those same truths that you have rescued us, Christ, through your great blood, uh, your, your blood, your great love. Um, we've been reconciled to God through you apart from any effort of our own, uh, anything that we could bring to the table uh, except the sin that put you on the cross, except the sin for which you had to die. God, thank you for such a, an act of grace as we turn our attention now and continue to worship through the opening of your word, the preaching and, and hearing of your word. I pray that you would make us embrace what is the only right response to such incredible wisdom that would put Christ on the cross, uh, is to heed it, to listen to it, to embrace it, to pursue you. And we ask that you would make our hearts eager and inclined to do just that right now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. And please open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 2. We'll be in Proverbs chapter 2 this morning. I actually want to introduce this passage to us where we're parachuting into the beginning of Proverbs chapter 2. I want to introduce this passage with the one that immediately precedes it. So Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20. And this will help us get a, a running head start on where we'll dive in. Proverbs 1, verse 20, Solomon writes, Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffer, scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you, then you will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Yahweh, would have none of my counsel, and despise all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Here we find wisdom crying out everywhere she can be heard, in the street, in the markets, at the head of noisy streets, at the entrance of the city gate. And she's warning those who are refusing to listen to do just that, to listen. Stop going on the direction, on the path, where they are headed, and as we read, verse 23, to turn. That's repentance language. In Israel, at this time, 
you could have found God's wisdom everywhere, especially in Solomon's day. The nation was known for godly wisdom in that day. In fact, the nations were streaming into Israel just to hear of the wisdom that God had given his people, namely in their king at the time, King Solomon. Even in Moses, God's wise words were supposed to be everywhere, written on gates, written on doorposts. They were supposed to be recited to one another, memorized and tucked away. And so wisdom in Israel was readily available. That's the picture. Similar to Israel, we too, if you're at Grace Bible, if you've been at GBC for any length of time, are in a truth-rich environment. And so this functions as a similar warning. You can find yourself surrounded by wisdom, constantly hearing wise words, and yet not heeding wisdom's voice. This was a warning to Israel, and similarly, this is a warning to us. We see that there is a category of people who do not listen despite being surrounded by wisdom, hearing constantly her wise voice. And according to verse 2, all it takes to be killed or destroyed is a turning away, a complacency when hearing wisdom. So what's the proper response for people like us, like Israel, in a truth-rich environment, constantly hearing God's wise words? What's the proper response to wisdom calling out? The answer is simple. Heed. Listen. If wisdom cries out, you must respond affirmatively. You must heed her voice. After describing the disaster of not listening... The natural next thing to say is what we encounter in chapter 2, verse 1. A series of conditional statements encouraging the listener, the one hearing, again, wisdom's voice, to respond positively. Chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of Yahweh and find the knowledge of God. You see the series of conditional statements, if, 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 Really, eight times this is expressly stated or implied that there's a condition on which the rewards of wisdom will come that we'll see unfold in the rest of the chapter. But the conditional statements actually encourage us to slow down and take inventory. It encourages us to slow down and not presume too much whether or not we are listening to God's wisdom. How do you know if you are heeding God's wisdom? Well, wisdom requires six things in these eight conditional statements. Humble receptivity, proper valuation, careful listening, inner eagerness, prayerful dependence and diligent pursuit. Anyone heeding God's wisdom 
the way that God requires is characterized by these things. Humble receptivity at the beginning of chapter 2, verse 1. If you receive my words. This is the listener coming to God, coming to God's wisdom with an open hand. In humility, confessing that I don't have the answers that I need. Therefore, I'm in a position of humility to just receive with an open hand whatever God has to say. No obligation, no command, no duty, no imperative is too much for me to listen and receive. If you receive my words, this is humility, this is humble receptivity. Also, proper valuation is required. If one heeds God's wisdom, he will not be humbly receptive, but he will have proper valuation. Treasure up my commandments with you. This is a storing up, tucking something away, something valuable that's not just left out in the open, but it's stored up for safekeeping. Like treasure, it's hidden within you. Treasure up my commandments with you. So there is a premium put on the instruction coming from wisdom's voice. Knowing that these are the words of the only wise God, the person properly treats them like treasure and tucks them away. If you receive my words, if you treasure up my commandments with you. And thirdly, careful listening. This heeding wisdom requires careful listening. Again, the if is implied in these two lines of verse 2. If you make your ear attentive to wisdom, there's a careful listening happening here. The ear being the avenue through which wisdom is gained, through which instruction is heard, then the ear is made attentive. There's an eagerness here, a carefulness with the wisdom being received. And also not just a humble receptivity or a proper valuation or a careful listening, but an inner eagerness, inclining your heart to understanding, inclining your heart to understanding. It's a bending of the inner self, a bending of the soul or the heart in a certain direction, in specifically the direction of understanding. So your heart, that word that is uh, control central, the control center of the person where your thoughts, your desires, your motivations, your convictions, what you believe, know, think, say, and do all begin in the heart. You are taking that and inclining it, bending it, stretching it forth towards God's wisdom, God's understanding. That describes an inner eagerness behind or within, rather, the person hearing God's wisdom. And also verse 3, a prayerful dependence. A prayerful dependence, a calling out for insight, a raising the voice for that same understanding. Where the heart is inclined, the voice is raised. This is a dependence a recognition that the, the one giving the wisdom is just that, the one giving the wisdom. Wisdom lies with him. Therefore, we, the recipients, are dependent on him to receive it, to give it to us so that we can receive. So there's a crying out for this. Anyone not asking God for wisdom is not depending on God to get it. A lack of prayer, prayerlessness, is a sign of self-sufficiency. That we believe 
we can get it on our own. We can do it on our own. And so wherever we are prayerless, those things for which we don't pray are the things for which we are not depending on God to attain. And finally, this heeding of wisdom is characterized by diligent pursuit. Verse 4, diligent pursuit. If you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, things that can't be easily found, that only yield themselves to the diligent, those who willingly toil and labor to find them, constantly chipping away at the worthless things to get what's really valuable underneath, those are the people to whom God's wisdom yields itself. The person must seek it like that, search for it like that. It is only after wisdom has made herself available and only after she has been sought heated in these terms with a humble receptivity, a proper valuation, a careful listening, an inner eagerness, prayerful dependence, and diligent pursuit, it is only after that that the rewards of wisdom come. So anyone here desiring to be rewarded by wisdom must be about heeding wisdom like this. If there's anything in that initial four verses that you think is too difficult, that you're not about putting in the effort, that sounds like it's too much, then you have just checked out on the benefits of God's wisdom. The rewards come to those who pursue wisdom on God's terms described in these first four verses. If one only heeds God's wisdom in this way, then these rewards that follow are as certain, really as wet grass can be found after rainfall, they certainly come. So claim these rewards specifically by heeding God's wisdom. And you see this, how they unfold Just in in many of the words in in this chapter, verse 5, then, verse 6, for Yahweh gives wisdom. Verse 9, another then. Verse 16, so that, or so, you will be. And then another so, in verse 20, so, you will walk. These are all results or products of having done the first four verses. A humble, diligent pursuit of God's wisdom unfolds in these incredible rewards. Six rewards belong to those who heed God's wisdom. That's our outline for today. Six rewards belong to those who heed God's wisdom. Number one, successful searching. The first reward to the one who heeds God's wisdom on God's terms is number one, successful searching. How great to know that you have been commissioned by God on a diligent pursuit of something and already at the starting line, you're promised success in your search. How's that for encouragement to go seek it out? Verse 5, then you will understand the fear of Yahweh and find the knowledge of God. The search results in understanding and finding. It's successful. Do this, this follows. Seek this, you will be rewarded with two things in particular. Understanding of the fear of Yahweh and finding the knowledge of God. So the fear of Yahweh and the knowledge of God are the things, the rewards specifically in view. 
These have been rightly called the twin towers of true religion. The fear of Yahweh and the knowledge of God. To live in God's world, the God who created everything, under his authority, with a knowledge of him, having access to the instructor who wrote the instruction manual for how to live in his world, is truly a grace. Solomon told us already from the opening of Proverbs in verse 7 that it was the fear of the Lord, the fear of Yahweh, that was the beginning, is the beginning of true knowledge. It was this fear, this knowledge, that fools actually despise wisdom, instruction. They despise these things. So don't be a fool. Be wise and fear the Lord. Be wise and find the knowledge of God. The one who engages in a humble, diligent pursuit of God's wisdom, who heeds God's wisdom in that way, is promised successful searching. Why? Well, that's the second reward mentioned, verse 6, which says, For Yahweh gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. The knowledge that's sought, the wisdom that is pursued, the knowledge that's eventually found in this humble, diligent pursuit is actually here revealed to be given by Yahweh. This is why the sixth search is, ses- is successful, because God is gracious. The search for wisdom is successful because God is gracious to give wisdom. This is describing divine generosity. Divine generosity. This comes from God's person, from God's mouth, and from God's treasury. Look again from at verse 6. For Yahweh gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. This divine generosity is from God himself. Verse 6 says, for Yahweh, the one who owns wisdom, gives wisdom. This is from him. It's also specifically from his mouth. From his mouth come what's sought after, knowledge and understanding. You don't have to look very far to find God's wisdom because it's specifically given by him through What he has said, it's found in his word. From his mouth, this wisdom comes. It's from his mouth that he demonstrates or displays his divine generosity. And from his treasury, verse 7, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. This is the same word that we already encountered in verse 1. And treasure up my commandments with you. The treasure up is the same word, stores up. You store up, and God will have stored up. You treasure, and God dispenses treasure. Gives of from his treasury of sound wisdom. All of these synonyms for how to live rightly in God's world is what we're encountering. The wisdom, the understanding, the insight, the understanding, the knowledge, the sound wisdom, all of those being different facets of describing a right ordering of the life under God's authority in God's world. This is what it means to live in the fear of God. For anyone willing to heed God's wisdom on God's terms, he's storing up sound wisdom for them. They are called, according to verse 7, the upright. 
the upright. They are called those who walk in integrity. This walk all across scripture ends up characterizing or capturing the idea of a consecutive, consistent pattern of life. This is how people got around at these times. And so the person who's walking in integrity isn't describing someone who's achieved perfection, you understand, but it's describing someone who, as a pattern of life, lives in this way with integrity. When no one else is around, they live uprightly in the fear of God. This is what it means to have integrity or to be upright, meaning straight, upright, righteous. For those people who live that way, the ones who are not content to just dwell in a truth-rich environment and take it easy because it looks like they're a part of everyone else who is upright actually, the people who take this to heart and live before God in public and in private in an upright way, verse 8 says, God does this, guards, or he is the one guarding the paths of justice, watching over the way of his saints. He's a shield to them. We'll return to that second line in verse 7 about him being a shield. That's significant. But just notice as he is what God is doing as this upright one, this one with integrity walks, lives his life. He's guarding the paths of justice, watching over the way of his saints. You have two words there, guarding, watching over. The same two words appear in Proverbs 4, 23. We love that passage around here. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. The keep, the vigilance, are the same words, guarding and watching. They can be translated guarding, watching, or keeping. The idea is the same. It's of a soldier keeping watch over the king, over an authority, or some area he's been given to protect. In Proverbs 4.23, vigilantly, or with all watchfulness, we are called to watch our own hearts. Well, here it's not us or the one with integrity doing the watching. God himself is doing the guarding. God himself is doing the watching. And it's over the paths of justice, over the way of his saints. Those terms, paths, way, uh, really describe uh, a path or a, a trail that would have been marked out in some field where wagons were constantly being pulled by animals over it. And so eventually this just became a well-worn course. The term here is practiced in that way by the saints, the holy ones of God. For them, holiness is this well-worn way of life. They know it well because they're constantly on it. He watches over them. He watches over that way. He guards that path. And because they're constantly on it, they are constantly guarded by God. This third reward Besides successful searching, besides divine generosity, these ones who carefully, humbly, diligently, prayerfully heed God's wisdom are also given sufficient understanding. Verse 9, 
sufficient understanding. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. The four things that capture the idea of sufficient understanding are listed all there in verse 9. Righteousness, justice, equity, every good path. This just describes the gamut of upright living, of good living. Righteousness, what is right. Justice, what's due every man. Equity, how to treat others fairly. And if anything else falls outside of that, well, that too. Everything, every good path, anything that is good. And notice verse 9, it's only then you will possess this understanding. Too often, people are insisting, we are insisting on having understanding of what's right, what's just, what's equitable, what's good, before we've practiced a humble, proper, careful, eager, prayerful, diligent, pursuit of God's wisdom. Well, that's not how God says wisdom comes, how this understanding is obtained. Sufficient understanding. You can know, but that must be predicated by heeding God's wisdom on God's terms. The reason given in verse 10 why this understanding can be possessed is because Wisdom will come. It will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Those two things always go together. Whenever wisdom comes into the heart, the soul experiences the pleasure of obtaining knowledge. If you have yet to rejoice over God's wisdom or wherever you see yourself not pleased with God's wisdom, It is because wisdom has not yet entered your heart. God's wisdom brings with it joy. This is why the Christian life is characterized by joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Wherever God's Spirit has brought God's wisdom, joy accompanies those things. Wisdom will come into your heart. Knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. And then he goes into specific ways that this occurs. This describes the fourth reward belonging to those who heed God's wisdom is divine protection. Successful searching, divine generosity, sufficient understanding, and divine protection are given to those who heed God's wisdom. What is this divine protection? We've gotten a glimpse of it already in verse 8. Solomon details it further in verses 11 through 19. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. Delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the way of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil, And delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. And further, you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. This is divine protection. God granting his wisdom protects those who willingly heed that same wisdom. This is divine protection from a few things. You have them listed for you there. From self-destruction, from certain destruction, from stupid delinquents and seductive dames. You get all of this packaged neatly here. First, from self-destruction. Notice 
backing up into verse 8, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Uh, God is a shield to those who walk in integrity, verse 7 says. So God himself is doing the protection, but it's through the means of the person heeding his wisdom, actually obtaining that wisdom. The one who walks in integrity, the one who, again, is a holy one, knowing that well-worn path of holiness. This is how God protects them. We got a picture of this in chapter 1 where Solomon gives wisdom coming from a parent, father's instruction, mother's teaching, and then he specifically instructs his son in verses 8 through verse 19 of chapter 1 how to avoid self-destructive behavior, the kind of behavior that would make friends with violent men who take the life of the innocent Describing sort of uh, gangsters, people who would take advantage of the innocent, seeking unjust gain. Look, look back at chapter 1 and what he says in his parental instruction. Verse 10, if sinners entice you, another condition, this is what you need to do, do not consent. If they say to you, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood, let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. You can see the enticement coming in the form of something that they're describing as valuable, precious goods. They're being told to store up or treasure something other than God's wisdom. He says, verse 15, My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird, but these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. In just those last three verses, he rips the mask off of what's actually going on. They are seeking precious valuables, and Solomon, pulling back the curtain, so to speak, tells his son what's actually going on. Just like it would be vanity to set a net out for a bird and try and coax it to come in where the bird can clearly see the net, that's what's happening here. They don't see the trap that they're setting for their own lives. They lie in wait for blood but the ambush is set for their very own lives. This is the way of everyone who's greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its own possessors. If he, Solomon's son, were to join himself with these thugs, he would be taking away the life, his own life. And so by heeding God's wisdom, God's wisdom guards him by keeping him from self-destructive behavior. Not only is this divine protection, protection from self-destruction, but certain destruction. Verse 12, delivering you from the way of evil. From the way of evil. The way of evil, this path, acquainted with evil, possessed by evil men even, it only ends, as we already saw at the end of chapter 1, in certain ruin. And so God's wisdom is protection. Stupid delinquents is also in view. Men of perverted speech, verse 12. These are the kinds of men, their speech is not upright, not straightforward. 
They're liars, apparently. Who do what, verse 13? Forsake the paths of, upright, of uprightness. They don't walk on those well-worn paths of holiness. They instead walk in the ways of darkness. They actually take joy, pleasure, not in wisdom, but instead, verse 14, in doing evil. Evil is fun to them. Wrongdoing is like a joke to the fool. And they delight in the perverseness of evil. Perhaps this is reminiscent of your own life before Christ. You can remember taking pleasure in things that God calls shameful, delighting in evil, eagerly running when you had the opportunity, an invitation came, and with no thought at all, you ran to those opportunities. Now that you've obtained God's wisdom, how do you feel about those same shameful past practices? You avoid them. You're ashamed of them. You don't walk on that way any longer. That's a sign, that's an indication that wisdom has come into your heart. Knowledge is now pleasant to your soul. Praise God. These are men who are devious in their ways. And finally, God's divine protection rewarded by the one, the one who's receiving, heeding God's wisdom, these seductive dames, uh, verses 16 through 19, forbidden women, they're adulteresses with smooth words, they're the kinds of women, verse 17, who forsake the companion of her youth and forget the covenant of her God, her husband, her marriage vows are what's in view. God's wisdom protects from the adulteress. She's the kind of woman, verse 18, her house sinks down to death, her path to the departed. So all who go to her don't come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. This is a warning against the life-altering, destructive nature of adultery. Changes the marriage relationship changes uh, one's reputation. Especially in Israel, this would have been true because the consequence for adultery was what? Stoning. You would end up dead committing adultery in Israel. So this is a warning. To simply heed God's wisdom, you would be richly rewarded with life. Fifthly, the reward for the person who humbly, diligently seeks God's wisdom is enduring godliness. That's what's in view in verse 20. Enduring godliness. This isn't a flash in a pan godliness. But the person who embarks on this unending pursuit of God's wisdom is promised walking in the way of the good and keeping to the paths of the righteous. There again, that word, walking and paths. You can become familiar with God's well-worn path of wisdom, of righteousness, of what's good, if you first submit to God's wisdom in these terms. This is an unchanging, well-worn pattern of life. It's what's well known by those who please the Lord. That's why it is enduring godliness. It's not seasonal. You should find, Christian, some of those people in the body who have been walking down this path, right? Young married couples, young parents, new parents, Find those seasoned saints who've walked this path and just ask them how it's done. Ask them to come spend time with you in your house while you manage the chaos and just impart wisdom to you. 
Remember what we read in the middle of chapter 1? Wisdom cries aloud. She raises her voice. She cries out. She speaks. Just remember, notice where she does those things, chapter 1, verse 20. In the street, the markets, noisy streets, city gates, none of those are quiet places. And so that means wisdom can be obtained in the midst of what seems like chaos. Praise the Lord. You moms should rejoice at that. You can still obtain God's wisdom. You can receive God's wisdom even when it's inconvenient. If you wait for your life to be nice and tidy till a season of life when you're not busy to go get God's wisdom, you'll probably never get it because that season never comes. In the midst of your busy schedule, in the midst of your crowded life, make time for wisdom. And that's also instructive for older saints among us because you can be eager to just step into the midst of the chaos, as I've seen many of you do, and disciple, pour wisdom into the ones who need it in the midst of tremendous busyness. The way Gordon Lehman does that is he has you over for breakfast. (laughs) Carve out a little bit of time and you can get a lot of wisdom and some good pancakes. I've had them. Lastly, the last reward of a diligent, humble, proper, careful, eager, prayerful pursuit of God's wisdom is ancient blessing. Ancient blessing. That's what's in view in verses 21 and 22 when, it, when Solomon writes, For the upright will inhabit the land, and those with, again, integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. it can sound kind of like strange language. Just don't leave the context. And if you don't leave the context, if you're patient not to rush out of the context, then you can understand, lay hold of the wisdom that's here. Solomon's describing ancient blessing. Solomon, the king of Israel, being a Jew, has in view land. And just notice twice, once in verse 21, once in verse 22, land is mentioned. And then it, those with integrity remain in it, and the treacherous will not or, but the treacherous will be rooted out of it, or literally her. It's a feminine referencing back to the land. And we've talked about this uh, a number of, of sermons lately. The upright will inhabit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. That word, inhabit, just means a permanent stay in a place. Most often where where it occurs in Scripture, that, that Hebrew word in the original signifies permanency, endure an enduring stay in a place. And that, even if you don't know Hebrew, is obvious from the context, because the very next line repeats that with the word remain. They remain, they stay. The upright will inhabit the land. Those with integrity will remain in it. What's going on there? What's the permanent stay in the land all about? The reason this is ancient blessing is because it's describing ancient promises. Promises that were first given to Abraham. Flip back to Genesis chapter 15, and you can see the connection between what Solomon's talking about. What's the permanent stay in the land that Solomon has in view? Chapter 15, part of the Abrahamic covenant. Yahweh, the word of Yahweh comes to Abram 
After these things, verse 1 says, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Sound familiar? Proverbs 2. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. The word of Yahweh comes to Abram, says, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord Yahweh, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? He's got no children. Verse 3, and Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of Yahweh came to him. Notice the difference in be- between that verse and verse 1. Not in a vision, but now the word of Yahweh just comes to him, saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. Then Abram believed in Yahweh and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. He goes on. He said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans, one land to give you this land to possess it. And then he gives him assurance that he'll possess it. So the promise was to Abram, called him out of one land into another, Canaan, and told him he would possess it. Fast forward to chapter 17. Now at this point, Abram is 99 years old. Yahweh appeared to Abram, verse 1, and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Similar to what we find in Proverbs 2. Walking and uprightness or blamelessness, holiness, is what's in view. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall be called, or your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you. And kings will come forth from you. Abraham, who can expect to get land, can also now expect kings. I will establish, verse 7, my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you throughout your generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. All of these are portions, aspects of the Davidic covenant. Rulers, land, descendants, who actually do as Abraham, the father of faith, does, walks blamelessly. And notice in verse 7, or verse 8 rather, I will give to you and to your descendants. Now not only Abraham's in view, but also Abraham's descendants are going to inherit something. Namely, the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. Sounds permanent, doesn't it? And I will be their God. You will be my people. I will be your God. Back in Proverbs 2, Solomon's capturing this ancient blessing. This is, in essence, those who inherit the Abrahamic promises. Who becomes the recipients of the very promises that were told to Abraham 
in Genesis 15 and 17. Who inherits Abraham's rewards? Well, Solomon tells us the upright, those with integrity, not the wicked, not the treacherous. How are all of these things obtained? If you want to know who lives in such a way that they inherit what was promised to Abraham, who do you need to look for? What are the character markers? Well, we've already said them. They heed God's wisdom with humble receptivity, proper valuation, careful listening, inner eagerness, prayerful dependence, diligent pursuits. They live in an upright way. They live with integrity. This applies to us. Will you inherit the land? Will you be one who gets to remain in it? When those kings, specifically the one seed who's in view, comes and establishes that kingdom on earth, will you inherit the land? You have to be then today one who lives with integrity. Not content to just be in a truth-rich environment at Grace Bible Church, but you have to live with integrity in private. You have to live a life before God that is upright, that when no one else is around, God looks at your life, God looks at your thought patterns, God looks at your behavior and says, upright, blameless. That's the call. And those who heed God's wisdom, the way to get there, the way to live a life like that, is to humbly pursue God's wisdom. On God's terms, prayerfully dependent on him, not in your own strength, that's the call. We will be rewarded as those who live that way. We will be rewarded beyond our efforts. That's because Yahweh gives wisdom. Because of his graciousness and generosity to us, we can lay hold of his wisdom, and by virtue of laying hold of his wisdom, one day inherit his promises. Let's pray. God, thank you again for your word that reveals these things. We would undoubtedly still be walking in darkness, like the same men that your wisdom protects us from. These are incredible realities that are beyond us to uh, comprehend. They're beyond our ability even to believe them, to treat unseen realities like they are true before we can see them, before we have them. It is not in our ability to live like that. And so we're dependent on you to give faith, to empower saving faith, even sanctifying faith in us. And so would you be kind to us? Would you display your goodness to us in Christ in these very ways by enabling faith, causing us to believe, causing us to live in a way that proves we are citizens of the kingdom to come. And God, we do pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.